Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Palmer. I'm so glad you're with us. Our guest today, Charlie Koontz. You know him from NBC's Community. It airs on Thursdays at 8 p.m. He plays Fat Neil. Okay, just <laughs> that name in itself kind of conjures up a whole lot of thoughts and images, and that's why I wanted to bring you on to talk about the character of the show, but also the connotation right. of having a, a character named Fat Neil. I mean, you're a bigger guy, but I don't know, Fat Neil? <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. So let's talk about the community, and then we'll dovetail into your views on bullying. Okay. Great show. How did it all happen for you, and what are your thoughts on a character named Fat Neil? Well, I, I was just going around town looking for right. jobs like everybody else. Sure. And um, I came in an audition and I uh, just got this these one or two lines that um, were just sort of a one-off thing. And Was the character named Fat Neil then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, there was a little bit of a plan. Um, I wasn't sure how I fit into it. Right. But um, when I was on set, they were working on the Dungeons and Dragons episode, which sure. is the big thing of that, I, yes. that I got to do. Um, and they have on set, they have a video feed from set to the writer's room. And so they, while they were writing the episode and trying to figure out who was going to play this character, um, oh I just happened to be standing there. Oh, oh my. So, <laughs> That's phenomenal. So, yeah, it was a, a but, case of luck. So let's talk about the whole notion of playing a character named Fat Neil. Right. I, don't, I doubt that you're going to criticize the character name, but just give me a sense of what it means to you and what do you think it means to the viewers? Well, it's hard, you know. I mean, it's hard when you're going out and looking for jobs and stuff like that. I mean, you are a big, I am a right. bigger guy and uh, that kind of stuff. But uh, I've turned down some things uh, that are sort of written for right. heavier guys because they, they're sort of one-off jokes and right. kind of crude and rude and that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I love playing Neil. Sure. Um, it's, because uh, well, he, he's a real character. Right. He's got a real arc and, you know, the Dungeons and Dragons episode was the big thing where he was really depressed and the group sort of surrounded right. him. But since then, he's grown and he's working at the radio station Which, now. Which, in a lot of ways, I think is so very important because when you look at a lot of images coming out of the media, right. you know, look, 2% of us look like the, the, the runway models, you right. know, both male and female. Right. I don't, you don't. And so it can be very debilitating and demeaning and minimizing. Mm -hmm. And so to see a fully textured character like you that happens to be larger, I have to think, is really um, exciting. I mean, I know it's a different show, but a show like Mike and Molly, for example. Right. Two plus size characters. What a brilliant show. Yeah. They are overweight. It's part of the plot line, but not necessarily the whole part. And that's the whole thing. I mean, it, it, I would never go on. I would never go anywhere and say like I want to ignore completely the way that right. I look. You know, um, as an actor, like this is this is my tool. It literally. Yeah, this is the thing that I work with. So um, the thing that's interesting about this industry is that um, it does have uh, an ability to get into your head. Yes. You know, um, and the, the thing that I find really interesting about it is there are two equal parts to it. I mean, there's a business side of it. People want to keep their jobs. People. Of these are. This is all like market research kind of stuff. And then there's the creative part, and, and this is one of the only industries well, that goes into that. So I have a friend um, who was on a very successful show on NBC. She's plus size, and she was talking about losing weight, and that was not going to work. Right. She could not lose weight. I mean, that was her character. Right. So it, it cuts both ways. I want to talk, though, about you as, as Charlie. Uh, you grew up as a larger kid. And, you know, when I was growing up, larger kids went one of two ways. They mm -hmm. were loved as the class clowns or they were ridiculed, which right. was frustrating and still is. Um, what was your experience like? I was certainly more of a class clown. Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, I didn't um, run into a lot of the, the bullying and, right. and things like that. Is, uh, I think you're right. I think you, there's a moment where you either go in or you go out. Right. And I've seen a, a lot of guys and girls go in, and it, it becomes really, really tough. But what's nice is you are talking to students. You are talking yeah. to people in a, in a very serious way about the issue of being larger, plus size, whatever you want to call it. Because you know, even though it may not have been your experience, that like you said, you can go in, you can go out. And right. if you go in, it can be a really a life sentence of a lot of self-doubt. Right. Um, so tell me about your experiences. Well, the thing that's funny or interesting is um, it's not just about being overweight. I mean, right. there's a lot of marginalization on TV. Um, there's, you know, ethnic marginalization right. and sexuality and right. all that kind of stuff. So what I would like to do is just be seen as um, a face of somebody that you see, you know what right. I mean? There are a lot of images on TV of just 
but people I, that you don't usually but see But I have day to, to day. think, I mean, I actually, you know, I met Melissa McCarthy once. And she's, fantastic. She, she's very talented for Mike and Molly Bridesmaids. And she kind of owns her, yeah. her plus size nature and recognizes that she, I mean, even Cameron Mannheim, remember Cameron right. Mannheim yeah, yeah, from yeah. the practice? I mean, when she won her Emmy, I remember she held up the Emmy and said, this is, all, this is for all the fat girls. Right. I mean, so in a lot of ways, you can own it. You can be an icon. You can be an idol. Uh, is that what you are doing? Are you trying to downplay it a bit more? Or how are you using this, this gift in some ways? <laughs> well, I want it to be, um, the thing that I try to look for in my career as it develops is that I don't want this to be the one thing that defines me, you know what I mean? But when you talk to kids, because that's what you've been doing, you're right. trying to focus on kind of stop bullying. Right. Tell me what, what that's like for you and for them. It's great, um, it, it's bizarre how often it happens you know it's such a big thing now mm -hmm. um but you know we, you've got bully the movie that came out and Oof. um that was intense you look at that kind of thing and you go i can't even believe that this is still happening but also at the same time it's become such a huge issue that now we're just realizing oh bullying is a thing but not what you're supposed to do about it you know i was really lucky because i had a great uh, family support and friend support and I played in a band rock band in high school and it's interesting because I was the flip side of you which <laughs> was when I was in high school I was the exact same height right. and 50 pounds lighter right and if you look at me I think of, of average weight you imagine me guy. well but in terms of weight right. I mean imagine me 50 pounds lighter and that caused tremendous challenges in terms of bullying and I was often the victim of verbal and even sometimes physical assault because I was so slight right and so you know no doubt it left certain scars per se but I did have a strong familial unit right. that was able to boost me up and and kind of and that's what you and need. that's I what think, happened with you. Yeah, I think uh, I think a lot of that stuff is part of growing up too. You know what I mean? It's um, well, what about kids aren't that kids aren't I, that nice. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to be stereotypical, but I just got to ask. I mean, you were from the Bay Area. Yeah, and one could argue the Bay Area is pretty um, welcoming. Um, you know, it's not quite as judgmental as other places. Is that stereotypical? Uh, it's the same as everywhere else. I mean, if you grow up somewhere, I mean, that's your hometown. That's right. the hometown that you know. I was a little bit east of San Francisco, okay. so, um, you know, it's, it's the same everywhere. And I think that uh, just the, the marginalization thing, it's, the, it's a show of insecurity. You of know course. what I mean? It's when you wear your insecurity on your sleeve and, you know, you're growing up, you're in elementary school or in high school, your body's changing, you look weird and right. all this kind of stuff. And it's when it gets into your head. One of the interesting things about bullying that I read was um, a huge part of it is repetition. You know, that it's just repeated and repeated and repeated the same uh, name calling and things like that. And name calling is even interesting. It's, it's you are this way. It's another person saying you are this way. You are short, you are fat, you are skinny, you are gay, right. you are whatever. And that's, that is where the identity crisis comes from. Absolutely. Because that, that, to me, is supposed to be a time where you can be insulated by love and support uh, with your unit, your family unit or your friend unit. Right. That's when you're supposed to make your mistakes and, and realize who you are and who you're, you're so supposed right. to be. I want to thank you so much for joining us, for what you're doing to talk to the people of America, both about yourself and just on a great show that's called Community on NBC. Thank you. It airs on Thursdays at 8 p.m. My name is Brad Palmer. So I want to thank you so much for watching Charter California Edition. We'll be right back. According to a 2009 National Institute of Health study, which form of bullying is most common? Cyber, physical, relational, or verbal bullying? Verbal bullying has become the most prevalent form of bullying, with relational bullying a close second. Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. I am so glad you are still with us. We are joined by Samuel Dweck. He is the director of the Ola Mexico Film Festival. Of course, in California, Southern California, we have a thriving Latino community. 
and I am so glad that this film festival is in Los Angeles. It's the hub of the film festival in the United States of America. Samuel, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate Indeed it. Indeed, pleasure. Before we talk about the film festival, which is coming up from May 24th through the 30th, tell us about yourself. How did you become the director, founder of the film festival? I was living in Australia. I was doing a master's in event management, mm -hmm. and I wanted to create my own event. Clearly. And I thought the film festival would be a good idea, not only because uh, that same year, it was the year that Iñárritu del Toro and uh, Cuarón, they were all nominated for Oscars, the right. big three amigos. Then I saw all these films going to, to Cannes Film Festival in Berlin, and I saw a lot of Mexican films being getting international recognition. Therefore, I thought of bringing all of them to Australia for a nice film festival. And, and I would presume Australia doesn't have the thriving Mexican or Latino community oh. that we do. You know, it, it has a lot of Latinos from Does Chile it? and from Colombia, okay. but not many Mexicans. So when people heard about the Mexican Film Festival, they were very interested because Mexico is really exotic in Australia. It is. I want to ask you about the Mexican cinematic industry generally. You know, for English speakers, we think of Univision, Telemundo, but we know that some of the product coming off of those television networks may come from Colombia or Venezuela. Is Mexico a strong, uh, does it have a strong filmic industry, be it in television or film? Yes, I would say very strong. Um, not only is the government putting a lot of money into the production of films, but there's a lot of private companies also mm -hmm. putting money to make films and also a lot of telenovelas. So of the, the entertainment that's coming out of Mexico ends up in Argentina, in Venezuela, everywhere, and same in Univision. And so Telemundo. if I watch Univision, if I watch Telemundo, Am I watching mostly Mexican product or am I watching product from Southern American nations? Southern American nations oh, really? and Mexico. Okay. It's a, it's, I think it's a healthy combination. Okay, well, let's talk about this film festival. It's very exciting. It's coming up May 24th through the 30th. It is in Hollywood. If you want to learn more about it, I'll just tell you right now, the website is Ola. MexicoFF.com. Uh, tell us about the festival. The festival is a great opportunity for people to go and see the real Mexico. As we'd like to say it, adios cliches. Forget about the cliches. Forget of about course. the mariachis and the burritos. Let's go into Mexico, into real Mexico, and let's see what's happening nowadays. We have more than 15 films, 15 different visions of directors telling you stories that are coming from Mexico. And the films are all in Spanish, I presume? Mostly. Of Any subtitled? All of them have all English of them subtitles. subtitles. Yes. Not dubbed, but subtitled. No, no, no. They're all in Spanish with right. English subtitles. Which is wonderful. Now, you have your opening night film, which is an extremely accomplished film. It's called uh, Dias de Gracia, or Days of Grace. Tell yes. us about this film. Well, this film is unbelievable. This film premiered internationally at the Cannes Film Festival. Just the Cannes Film Festival. Yes. Just the most successful, well-known, prominent film festival in the world. Exactly. And the film was able to get a talent from like Scarlett Johansson is singing in the soundtrack. Wow. The soundtrack is done by Atticus Ross, who was nominated and won an Oscar for right. the social network. Sure. Uh, the, this film talks about three different kidnappings pairing the three different World Cups that Mexico has had in the last 12 years, 2010, 2006, and 2002. And these are true stories? It's based on true stories. Based, okay. And the, the, the film goes into the story, but you'll see different kidnappings at different times. So at some point, you don't know what's going mm. on. And then you delve into it, and once you're in it, it's a roller coaster that doesn't let you go. Uh, generally speaking, you know, when Anglos think about Mexican entertainment, I don't know, we have this view, it's very larger than life, beautiful women, lots of makeup, big hair. <laughs> yes. In the best sense, telenovelas, that's what we know. Yes. But is that just but one element of Mexican entertainment? It is only one element. Right. Uh, as you may see in this festival, we have films that go through a wide spectrum of children animation, documentaries, comedies, dramas, horror films, everything. Mexico produces all types of films, and they're all very highly produced and very well made. They are well high, high production values. All of them. You mentioned children's films, and I actually am going to take my children to see one of them. My children, God bless them, speak Spanish well. I'm learning. It's, it's a difficult tr uh, task for me. But tell us about two of the uh, children's films. Yes, of course. One of them is the famous character 
Don Gato y su pandilla. Of course. Top Cat, yes. who made famous by Hanna Barbera in the 80s. We know it. Mexican producers bought the rights to these characters and they're creating this film. It's all produced in Mexico and it's extremely hilarious. The other one is called La Leyenda de la Llorona. And La Llorona is this very big, famous character from Mexico about that scares the little kids because it, it all happens uh, when this lady got their kids kidnapped and now she's kidnapping all these kids. This is, goes from like the late 1800s. I understand. And this film is now a really nice comedy that did very well in Mexico. So besides those three films, which are exciting and I'm sure we'll go see them, what other films would you like to highlight? I know they're all your children. <laughs> it's hard to pick a few, but what other films are particular highlights? I mean, I see you have um, fiction, nonfiction documentaries. Yeah, talk, talk to us about a documentary maybe. Yeah, well, documentaries in Mexico are now being very well respected. There's a film called The Panzazo, which tells about the students and the education system in Mexico what's happening with, uh, with the students, with the families, and with the school system, with the government, with the, all the teachers. And this documentary done by Juan Carlos Rulfo and Carlos Loret de Mola, who are very mm -hmm. famous in Mexico, go deep into the school system and find out how many teachers are in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Are they being interviewed? Are there being, uh, is there exams for them? What are they teaching our kids? You know, because in what Mexico, we learn? we learn that uh, there's a lot of things we can change and there's a lot of things to do. And uh, it's an incredible film, and we invite everyone in USA to see what's happening in Mexico. Tell me about who's attending this festival and, and the pride that they uh, actually feel when watching these films coming, often from their homeland if they happen to be Mexican. Of course, well, we have a big majority being Mexican people, very, many of them very new in this country, people that they are day by day knowing what's happening in Mexico, mm -hmm. you know? People they call their families, they know this Mexican music oh, band, see, this course. Mexican film, they know everything. For them, the, the border between Mexico and USA, it's pretty much in the papers. Right. Because they'll see the live TV and they'll see the, everything, all the entertainment is pretty much the same. But they haven't had the chance to go to a movie theater to see this. And on, not only they go to the movie theater, but they get to meet the directors, meet the actors, uh, have a, you know, a good time with all the people that are like them in the theater. What about the platform that this can provide for the directors, the producers, the actors? Because in the end, when you think about film festivals, the hope is that your film is seen and either the film gets picked up for distribution or you get brought on by a company who likes your work. H has it happened in the past or? Yes, well, we are in Hollywood at the end of the day. Yes, you are. And this is where all the film magic happens. And some of our sponsors, like uh, Panteleon and Walt Disney Company, they're companies that all often buy products. And Cine Latino, mm. most of our films they've bought for TV rights to display Already. here. Yes. So uh, it's a great opportunity for these filmmakers to come here and, and sell their films for, for many American distributors. Most importantly, tell us exactly, again, how can we go? How do we buy tickets? Okay. I know our audience will want to know. Perfect. So our film festival is from May 24th to May 30th. Most of our information is on our website, which is www.olamexicoff.com. Mm -hmm. And tickets are extremely cheap. You can buy them online for $8 or at the box office for 10 which is very cheap compared to any AMC film or any other film. And these films are only going to show once in a theater, and that's it. And so is it at the, where is it exactly, though? So the Montalban Theater is on Vine Street between Hollywood and Sunset. Okay, got it's it. It's right next so to that's the that's nice. A Amiba. nice theater, a nice space? It's beautiful. Okay, it's I stunning. am so glad to have met you, and I'm so glad that you are bringing outstanding Mexican cinema to uh, the United States, to Los Angeles. And I hope that some of our Anglo viewers will consider attending this festival because the Latino culture is so rich and so diverse. It is. And I appreciate you joining it's us. My pleasure. You bet. His name is Samuel Dweck. He is the founder director of the Ola Mexico Film Festival. My name is Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on Charter California Edition. What percentage of Americans aged 18 to 40 have at least one permanent tattoo? 10, 15, 25 or 40 percent. According to a 2011 Washington Post article, more than 40 percent of Americans aged 18 to 40 possess at least one permanent tattoo. 
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. I'm really glad you're with us because I'm going to introduce you to someone that really typifies a part of our society that many of us look at. We don't know much about. We want to learn more about it. There's this kind of fascination. His name is Trace Edwards. Let's just say he is one of the nation's premier tattoo. Are you an artist as well? I have no drawing ability whatsoever. But you have beautiful tattoos on your body. I'm a collector. You're a collector. And an organizer of, you know, logistics. And the logistics that he's organizing come Coming up on June 8th to the 10th at the Queen Mary of all places is the Ink and Iron Tattoo Festival. And there is a reason why this festival, a major West Coast tattoo festival, is in Long Beach. Talk to us about the history of tattoo artistry in Long Beach. Well, uh, somewhere around the turn of the century, we Long Beach developed the pike. Um, and so in the pike, it was like our version of New Jersey's boardwalk. Got it. It had uh, rides, carnival games, restaurants, uh -huh. um, and a series of tattoo shops. Why? Naval base, right, right adjacent. Long Beach has also been home to that that whole military sure, base. Sure, of course. So, which I think we lost in like the early yeah, '80s. So, um, but that back going back to 1927, you have Burt Grimm's tattoo shop, and it continuously operated in the Pike from 1927 to 2003. And now, is it still there, sort of? It's there. It's now uh, a Carrie Barber's Outer Limits. Okay. Um, the only difference is it's high-rises are built all around but it, and you have to go look for it now. Can you still get a tattoo at this location? Oh, full-service tattoo shop. So, in effect, this location has been providing tattoos since 1927. Correct. It's remarkable. Right. Now, from the shot that we have now, we can't see, but you have some, you know, beautiful tattoos yep. on your body yourself. Yep. yep. I understand you have your grandmother. Yep. Right this is here. a 1939 portrait on my left side. Uh huh. Uh, Frankenstein on my right side. Okay. Talk to me about the tattoo culture because. I am not a part of it, but it definitely interests me. I mean, there's that kind of fascination. Well, as humans, we have a fascination with moving pictures. Right. Um, once that picture could be applied to the body, and it's something you can stare back at, it, it right. just feeds the mind. Um, they were often started out as just earmarks as points in life. Uh, the military had a strong influence there. So a guy goes off to the Philippines sure. on tour, he gets a, you know, a little tattoo to memorate, mem yeah. commemorate that day. Right. So it starts from that point. And, and if we think about it, um, body art has been around for millennia. I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands. And it goes back to Egyptians. Sure. It's, it's, it, and in many African cultures, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's not just a part of society. Everyone yeah. has some form of body art, often that is permanent. Absolutely. Uh, in a, in a, as opposed to, you know, there could be earrings or whatever it may be. Um, so how did you become part of this uh, thriving culture that really is expanding in a lot of ways? Well, um, I had a close friend of mine who he started getting tattooed at the age of 16. Mm. Um, I didn't start till later on in life. Um, so, you know, in seeing his body art from the earlier points of time, I was like, ah, hey, you know, that's really not for me. Then it started to evolve and transcend into actual college-taught artists started picking up tattoo machines. I, I got to tell you, it is amazing to me the detail yeah. that you can find with some tattoo artists. I, I am literally... And skin's the hardest medium I, ever. I am okay? literally... I mean, even on your arm, the color yeah. is remarkable. And, and the shading and, and the way the color... It kind of, we're going to have to get some close-ups of yeah. that for sure, but the way the color can morph into a different shade or a lighter shade. And, and, the, and the piece on my neck is probably you know, a fine well, exa example of that. Okay, let's talk about the show. It is coming up. It's the greatest show unearthed. It is the Ink and Iron show, as I said, June 8th to the 10th at the Queen Mary, which actually held the first... Uh, tattoo convention on the west coast almost let me get my math right is it 40 years 30 years ago somewhere yeah 1982 yeah. right uh don ed hardy ed hardy infamous ed hardy right um him and a couple of his cohorts of the time uh put together a tattoo convention aboard the queen mary okay tell us about this coming convention it is an extravaganza there's actually <laughs> i mean is that am i right it, it's a 12 ring circus it, is what it's transcended into right. where 
we started this thing, it was tattoo cent concentric. Um, but from year one, the people that showed up brought uh, what their lives reflected, mm -hmm. albeit their car, their music, uh, their art. And so uh, being aware of all these ancillary, mm -hmm. you know, items that people are into, the right. connective tissue being tattoo. Well stated. We just simply kept adding components. Now it's got a full on, the iron represents not only the ship, it represents a full car show, the Motorama, which is also a resurrection of a car show that was on the pike in 1958. So it all harkens back. So the car show component, it represents Long Beach's history. The tattoo component, Long Beach's history. Then of course we've added 45 bands. Just 45. Across three Just stages. Just 45. And you have a full cabaret production. You have a full vaudeville production. You have a full, full international pole performer showcase, which come is on. these female athletes from around the world come in and we compete. And on let me tell a you, moms pole. in the suburbs, they're doing poles. They're getting it. I mean, they're on it's it. yeah, no, no, and they're getting in, tattoos. And, but, and their husbands well, are building both. cars. Yeah, but, but in a lot of ways, um, it's becoming somewhat mainstream. It has hit that mainstream. We, you know, we, we came into this about three, four years prior to TV. And once TV got a hold of it, it just shoved a whole lot of momentum into the whole social, socialization of it right. and, and just becoming acceptable across now all mainstream. How do you, you know, as, as an advocate for tattoo art, artistry, really explain and try to convince and try to talk about how tattoo really is artistry and it shouldn't be used as a weapon, meaning you know, gang insignia. Correct. Um, I mean, and that's, well, that's where it's gone. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's gone away from that underbelly of society. It used to be bikers, right. gangs. Yeah, military was about as, right. as, as right. Mainstream, mainstream as it got. Right. But then come the late 80s, and then you start the 90s, and now you start to see rock stars in mass getting tattooed. Mm -hmm. So it starts to penetrate into the music element. Now, music is a main element. Now, NBA, football, oh, no NFL. The only ones that aren't getting tattooed heavily are Major League Baseball. I think it's against their corporate policy, sure. their, their organizational policy. But do you feel as if it's become mainstream enough that the criminal element that had been... Oh, it's, it's, it's diminished. Right. The, that whole visual is diminished. And now, since we've come on with laser removal, right. now there's complete laser doctors that offer free tattoo removal for gang members. How do you members. feel about that? F in the conjunction of taking something that was put on your body for life that is absolutely derogatory reasons, or demeans right. another human, then yes, laser is absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. um, getting back to if you're getting the right tattoo, there's no ever a reason. There's never Fra a reason Fra to get rid of it. Yeah, Frankenstein. You know, <laughs> once it's connected to you personally, um, as part of your personality, but not your, your, the negative side sure. of what can be done. In, in our final moments, the convention's coming up, as I said, June 8th to the 10th. Highlights, what, what should we look for when we go? Ooh, well, there's, there's, so many. There, there's 11 highlights, 12 highlights, one for every component. I mean, okay. the art show's outstanding, the tattoo component. Guys are traveling in from 48 nations, over 25 states have registered. So it's a global community that's transcending on Long Beach and filling up 12 hotels for three days. Website is? www.ink-in. And the letter. In the letter, dash iron.com okay. I love iron.com again June 8th to the 10th at the Queen Mary the Ink and Iron Tattoo Show Trace Edwards thank you so much for joining us for having me it. absolutely my name is Brad Palmer thank you so much for watching Charter California Edition